Good morning, everyone. My name is Captain Tom Tersey from the Maryland School of Sailing, and our subject today is tuning your standing rig. And we thought with spring coming and people getting ready to launch their boats, it would be a good time to look at at the rig itself. I know that this is um, an item that so many sailors look at and they say, I hope it doesn't come down. I hope it stays up there where it belongs, but often have very little concept as to um, uh, how to tune the rig and what some of the aspects of it are. So we're going to talk about the rig, and this is not going to make you a professional rigger by any stretch of the imagination. It's to give you simply some insight as to what are some of the things to do and look for with your rig, and when to call a professional rigger. Hopefully, it'll, it'll help you with that to ward off potential issues with it. The rig on a sailboat is like a, stand, uh, like a house of cards. And if one card in that stack is out of place or comes apart, the entire rig is going to come down. So what you'd like to do with your rig, besides having it perform well, and have your boat therefore perform to its to its best. We'd like your rig also to have integrity and not and not to fail on you at an inopportune time. So I'm going to take my picture off here. I just wanted to let you see who's doing the talking and I'll go into my full screen mode for the presentation. This is a subject and the agenda things that I'm going to talk about today are um, well, things a sailor ought to know about his rig and how to look at it with, uh, look at it critically and in a constructive manner. And also what you ought to know before calling a professional rigger and should you call a professional rigger. And the examples that I'm going to use in this discussion are based on a simple sloop rig. Now there are many rigs on sailboats uh, much more complex than a simple sloop rig. But I'm going to use a sloop rig as a case study for uh, the adjustments that you'll make and the tuning that you ought to be aware of, but recognizing that as you get to more complex rigs, uh, the whole process becomes more complex. But this will still give you some insight into complex rigs. We'll also touch on some of the engineering aspects of masts and rigging. And this is to give you a little bit of background as far as some of the technical details to help you make some informed judgments as you, as you look at your rig. Every time I go on a boat, I always look at the rig. I'm always concerned with failure in the rig. And uh, what would I do if certain things happen? So uh, taking a critical look at your rig on a continual basis is, uh, is very advisable. Uh, the standing rig that we're going to talk about today includes the mast and the wires and hardware that keep, that keep the mast upright and properly shaped. Uh, it does not include running rigging, such as sheets, halyards, vangs, topping lifts, and so forth, the soft rigging. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the mast and those wires and the fittings that keep keep that all in place. The rig takes a lot, of, a lot of force, a lot of pressure. The forces are in the thousands of pounds, even on a 30-foot boat. So we're talking about some very large uh, forces and the potential for breakage in those, in those components. Uh, why tune your standing rig? Well, first off, it's just the longevity. You'd like, you'd like it to uh, remain intact. You would like it to um, do its job and not come apart. You'd like to improve sail performance because the rig, the mass shape, interacts with the sail itself. Changes in the shape of the mast will change the shape of the sail and therefore the performance of the boat. So you'd like to have your rig tuned uh, to optimum as concerns your, your sail performance. And you'd also like to avoid untimely failures and collateral damage. If something does break and the mass does come down, ultimately you could lose your boat because um, a rig that's down 
can punch a hole in, in the hull, which has happened on more than one occasion, it really makes a mess. So uh, you would like to avoid those sorts of situations. Now let's talk a little bit about the longevity of the rig itself. The mass and standing rigging for, form a lightly designed, relatively rigid structure. Now there's emphasis in this statement on lightly designed. Remember that this mast goes up, say on a 30-foot boat, it could be going up 30 to 40 feet. That's three to four stories above your deck. If it's too heavy, it's going to be a counterweight way up top, and it's going to make the boat roll and pitch more. It's going to make the boat less stable. So it is lightly designed. It's light, designed as lightly as can be made, but still have certain integrity. But it's, the rig is also, even though it's lightly designed, it's also relatively rigid because it has to carry some tremendous forces generated by the wind and the sails. And uh, it has to do this without too much distortion or else it will change the, um, the shape and the dynamics of the sails themselves. So it's lightly designed, but it's relatively rigid because each component has a job and it has to perform that job in order to retain the, the shape of the structure. Looseness in one part of your rig will cause increased loads and misalignment in another part. And the point there is that we cannot design the rig to have a 200 or have a 300, 400, 500 percent safety margin. That means that we're operating closer to the failure mode at all times. So it's important to keep the rig properly tuned so that you don't increase loads beyond what's necessary. Misalignment can cause load magnitudes and directions not provided for in the design. Certain fittings are, are designed with a certain uh, strength. And if you have misalignments in the rig, you can uh, increase those static loads, those loads on those parts, and this can lead to failure. Vibrations, resonance, or shock loading can rapidly fatigue components. And I'm sure that uh, many of you have experienced the situation where if you're sailing along and you might have some flutter in a sail and you, and you feel a resonance vibrating throughout the boat. You can hear it more down below than you can up on deck. And you feel this resonance. Well, something is vibrating and something is um, becoming fatigued because the loads on it are cycling. So you want to be aware of resonance and vibrations in your rig. And then there's also shock loading. And by shock loading, I'm talking about impact. In other words, there's a significant impact. And this can be caused by, um, by doing an accidental jibe. Or it can be caused by um, simply uh, having, when you're, when you're headed up into the wind and you have the sail flogging, it can be causing shock loading. So these are things that you would like to minimize if possible. Now stress that we've been talking about up to this point, when it's coupled with corrosion, will further accelerate the potential of failure. Let's, let's look at some aspects of um, stainless steel, which is used in uh, the construction of uh, our rigs, uh, the wires and the fittings and so forth and look at uh, three different aspects of it. One is the, the static stress that the rig is designed for and these components are designed for. If you take a rubber band and you stretch it and you keep pulling on it, eventually it's going to break. Well, you, you've, you've applied a what's called a static stress. That is, you're just plain pulling on that rubber band until it breaks. And metal parts and metal um, alloys when they're designed, they're subject to different uh, stress testing. And they'll put them in a the machine, and this green component shown here is a sample of a material which is put into a machine that pulls it. And when it pulls it, it stretches it like a rubber band. And when it stretches it, it necks down, as you see in this photograph here, 
it necks down to a thinner cross section and then eventually breaks. Now that's just plain stress fracture. A straight pull, no vibration, no corrosion, just a straight pull and it breaks. So the components in your rig, the, uh, the chain plates, the turnbuckles and so forth, are designed for certain stress levels. And as I mentioned before, it might be designed for 100% overload. Okay. Now add to that vibration and you're going to have a cycling stress, a cyclic stress. And think of the paper clip. If you take that paper clip and open it up and just pull on it, you're, you're going to be pretty hard pressed to break it with your hands. But if you take that paper clip and bend it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you're going to break it eventually. That is cyclic stress. We're taking the stresses and making the stresses go positive in one direction. Then we bend the clip the other way. We make them go positive in the other direction. And we go back and forth and eventually it simply breaks. And cyclic stress fatigue failures can occur at 50% below the static stress levels. Then beyond that we have corrosion and when we take corrosion and we're sailing a lot of the times in, in wet environments and in salt water, uh, you add that to the stress and we have a condition now called stress corrosion and that failure limit can be as much as 85% below the static stress fracture limit. In other words, it could fail at 15% of static stress. So these are things that you, you want to be aware of and keep an eye out for. And uh, we'll talk about these a little further as we go through the, the discussion. So the lesson in this is you want to minimize re resonance and minimize corrosion, and there are ways to do this, as these things can accelerate the failure mechanisms. Now let's look at a simple sloop rig. And what's shown here is a, a simple rig which is keel stepped. So the mast step is um, on top of the keel at, at, at the bottom of the hull. And uh, this mass then penetrates the, the deck and these red marks indicate uh, where this uh, mast is, is retained. And basically at, at the keel we have a mast shoe and at the deck we have deck wedges and at the mid-height we have the spreader support and at the top we have the truck at the top of the mast. But let's look at some of the terminology here on the wires. Here we have the head stay and the back stay. Now these hold the mast fore and aft. In many boats the, the back stay is a single wire. In some boats it's two wires that go up to the, to the mast head. And in some boats it's a single wire which is then split part way down and it goes into two wires as it um, attaches to the, to the transom of the boat. Even when you have a double wire or a double wire backstay, it will often have a single fitting that the wires are attached to, and then that fitting is attached to the mass truck with a single part. So even though it's a double wire, it may be a single attachment to the mass truck. Okay. So we have head stay and back stay. So stays are fore and aft, head stay, back stay. Let's look at the shrouds. The shrouds get their terminology from the, the, um, the veil or uh, that a woman might wear over her head and over her shoulders, and it gives us this shape of a veil, and that's where the terminology shroud comes from. So you can think of the shrouds as the side wires, if you will. So there's the upper shrouds that go from the deck level on up to the masthead. And then there are the lower shrouds that go from the deck level up to the, um, the mid-height or the spreader, the spreader level. 
And the lower shrouds normally have, although not always, but normally have a forward lower shroud and an aft lower shroud. So there would be four shrouds on the boat, uh, four lower shrouds, and two upper shrouds. This upper shroud is usually a continuous wire that simply passes through a groove in the end of the spreader tip. So let's look next at the spreader. And the spreader keeps the shroud, the upper shroud, spread away from the mast and helps to support the mast itself. So you have the spreader itself, which is a rigid aluminum, usually, part. And we have the spreader base, where the spreader attaches to the mast. And then we have the spreader tip, where the shroud wire passes through. And the tension in the shroud, the upper shroud, puts a compression on each side of the mast and holds the mid-length, the mid-height of the mast in position. And generally, when you have a column, uh, like this column, this mast is a column, and if you put a vertical load on this column, it's going to want to bow out in the middle if the middle is not supported. So the purpose of the spreaders is to support the middle of the mast. And generally, any time you get over about a 10 to 1 uh, height to diameter ratio of a column, it's considered a long column that needs mid-length support. Okay. Then we have the uh, chain plates, which attaches these wires to the hull. And we have the turnbuckles, which are the adjustments to the tension in these wires. All right. And looking further at terminology, we have the mass step that we talked about before. We have the deck wedges at the deck level. And I'll show you some pictures of these. And we have the masthead truck where the uh, stays and the shrouds attach. All right. And just by comparison, here is a deck stepped mast where the mast does not go down to the keel but it is stepped just on deck, as opposed to this keel step goes all the way down here. The deck step stops at the, at, the, um, at the deck. This is done for a couple of reasons. One is generally done on smaller boats where they're trying to save space down below and not have the obstruction of a mass below. And it's also done in boats that the owners want to be able to easily lower the mast in order to go under bridges. Uh, whatever the reason, it needs some sort of an internal support, either another support inside or a, a strong arch bar that's supporting under the, um, under the deck, because there's a tremendous compressive load down. Now, in the case of the keel step, this compressive load which is established by the tension in these shrouds and the, and, the, and the head stay and back stay, is pulling down on the mast and pressing it down onto the keel. But in the case of a deck step, it's pressing it down onto the deck. And therefore, that has to be resisted with some other structure, either a support bar down below or a strong arch bar across. So be aware of that. Now, some assumptions for this, this discussion. I cannot discuss every single aspect of tuning a rig, but uh, I'd like to point out where, where I'm uh, limiting my discussion. First off, we're not talking about design revisions being made in the rig. You're just uh, ready to relaunch your boat for the winter season, or if you're down south, just uh, doing your annual maintenance, and uh, you'd like to take a look at your rig, but you're not making design changes in that rig. There's no hydraulic rig tensioners installed. And a lot of times, racers will have hydraulic rig tensioners that can be used to change the tension in the, in the rig while sailing in order to change the shape of the mast and therefore the interaction of the mast and the sail. So I'm not talking about 
rigs with hydraulic rig tensioners in them. I'm also talking about a single spreader rig. Uh, as rigs get taller, they'll have two and sometimes three spreaders. Uh, we're talking about a single spreader in this discussion. Uh, chains, plate, tangs, turnbuckle swages, and other fittings uh, have been inspected and are okay. And I'm going to show you some of the inspection methods related to that, some of the techniques you can use. The wire condition has been inspected and verified as okay. That is, there are no broken wires in, in, in your rig. And when I say broken wires, I don't necessarily mean the entire wire being broken, but within each wire, it's wound with a, a group of smaller wires. And if you see one of those smaller wires broken, well, that entire wire has to be suspect. Deck wedges and mass boot are okay, inspected and okay. I'm going to show you pictures of these. A manufacturer's rigging specs are available. The manufacturers do and should provide you with um, the tension requirements for the wiring uh, that's used in the in the rig. Now, a lot of times, an experienced rigger will simply shake the wire and say, "That's that's good." Okay, and I would say for novices to, who don't really have that touch of experience with the rig that using a tension gauge is a wise thing to do. And to do this, you need the specifications from the manufacturer on what those tensions ought to be. And I'll show you how that's measured as well with a rig tension gauge. Uh, and I'll show you a rig tension gauge. And the sales and running rigging are subject of another discussion. I'm not going to be talking about those things during this discussion. So let's go on from here. Let's talk generally about the tune-up process. Now, in a simple summary, a two-step process, the sequence of events is to get the mast head properly located, and then secondly, tune the mid-height or tune the spreader level. Those are the two basic things you're going to be doing to tune up your to tune up your rig, but I've broken that simple summary down into a 12-step process. Okay, and I'd like to talk about the 12 steps. And what I'll do initially is summar summarize those very briefly, just to give you an overall concept of the of the 12 steps. And then we'll go back and we'll talk in detail about each step. Okay. So first off. Preparations. Uh, remove the sails and slack all your turnbuckles. Now, at this point, don't disconnect turnbuckles. Simply slack them off. The second part, clean and inspect and lubricate your turnbuckles, because as you tune your rig, you're going to be making adjustments in the turnbuckles, and you, like these, you would like these to be easy to turn and not be galling the threads as you're doing this. Thirdly, uh, center the mast head side to side and hand tighten your upper shroud turnbuckles. Now, this is the, the first step in getting the mast head in its proper location. You would like the mast head to be centered over the center of the boat. Okay, and I'll show you the method for doing that. Secondly, you'd like to set the mast rake. That is, is the mast standing, when viewed from the side, is it standing perfectly vertical, or is it leaning back some? And here again, uh, you have the manufacturer's recommendation, and you also have your experience with sailing the boat. And I'll talk about uh, what you should observe on mast rake. And the next step is hand tighten the lower shroud turnbuckles. Remember, the shrouds are the side-to-side -side wires. The lower shrouds are the ones that go up to the spreader level. Okay, So that's the first five of those. Now, going on, after you've got to that point, let me go back a second. Steps three and four, put the mast head where you would like it. The next steps now get to putting the spreader level where you would like it to be. So the first part of that portion is to now, now that you've hand tightened the lower shroud turnbuckles, 
Next, you want to tension to about half spec, that is about half of what the manufacturer says it ought to be. You want to tension your backstay lower shrouds and upper shrouds in that order to half spec using the tension gauge. Okay? After you've done that, you want to take a look at the mast and, and see if the mast has the shape that you want. Now, if we sight up the side of the mast, if we put our cheek against the mast and look up, we can see if the mast is straight going up to the masthead or if it's curved. And the question here is, does it have the fore and aft curvature that you want? And here again, you go back to the manufacturer, number one, for his recommendation, and also the sail maker, because what, what the sail maker does when he cuts the sail, if you take the sail and lay it out flat on the ground and stretch out, stretch out the three corners of it, you'll find that the luff of the sail is not a straight line. It's a curved line. So if the mast is curved to match the curve in the sail, then the sail will be flatter in its performance and will be better for upwind performance. This is why the racers use an adjustable backstay. So for upwind performance, they'll curve the mast some and therefore flatten the sail and get better upwind performance. But on the other hand, for downwind performance, you want the sail more uh, full, and therefore you would like the mast a little straighter. Uh, so you, you have to have some intermediate value. And again, guidance can be obtained from the manufacturer and or the sail maker on what sort of curve you should have in your, in your mast. And I'll show you images of this in a minute. Secondly, you want to sight up the front of the mast, put your cheek against the front of the mast, and see if there's any side-to-side -side bending in the mast. You want the mast in that, in that, from that view to be straight. You don't want any side-to-side any -side bending. Thirdly, you want to verify the masthead centering. Now, you recall from the original, the earlier steps, we originally um, centered the masthead, but after we did that, we started making some adjustments in the wiring tension, and we want to go back at this point and verify that the masthead is centered, still centered where you want it. Now, you might say, well, why don't I simply do this when I'm finished the whole job? And my answer to that is um, there's a, a, um, a reality in, uh, in structures under, under stress, and that's called hysteresis. And basically, when we apply a stress, a load, to a component, to, to a part, to the mass, to the wires, they'll stretch a certain amount. You recall that uh, sample that I showed you from the stress machine, that it stretched a neck down before it broke. Well, any component put under stress is going to, put under load, is going to stretch. When you relieve the load, it will return to its original shape, but not by the same path. That is, not by the same stress strain or stress elongation path. So you don't want to do this all at one point after you've gotten the complete uh, full spec load on these wires. You want to do it at each step of the process. So you're going to verify masthead centering again. Then you're going to compensate for any deviations of these things. You may increase the tension in one of the lower shrouds, decrease the tension in the lower one and another one, but basically get the four and a half curvature looking the way you want, get the mast side to side straightness, get the mast head still centered, okay? at half stress loads. After that, you're going to tension the, these head stay, back stay, lower shrouds, upper shrouds to three quarter stress. And you're going to again verify shape of the mass by the same process, okay? 
make compensations, and then go to full spec in that order, and again, verify shape. So it becomes a, a, an iterative process where you go back and forth on these, on these steps. But as you see, you're basically sneaking up on the final shape and not getting it all in one simple adjustment. And that's been my experience with, with doing this. After you've done all of this, you then want to conduct sea trials and find out how your rig performs under sail. And we'll talk about some details of that. So that's a summary of the steps in the process. And what I'd like to do at this point is talk about some of the details. Before we go into taking each of those 12 steps apart, I'd like to first interject some vector principles. Now, vector is an item that has both magnitude and direction, such as this rigging wire, this red rigging wire attached to a mast, and I show this rigging wire with 100 pounds of force, tensile force in it. And that's the magnitude. The 100 pounds is the magnitude of the force. The 30 degrees is the angle that that wire is forming with the center line of the mast. So you can say that this vector has a, a magnitude of 100 pounds at an angle of 30. Now, that force can be broken down into two different directions. The amount of force that's acting straight down on the mast and the amount of force that's acting in the horizontal to the mast. So let's look at this. The vertical component of this 100-pound force is pulling down on the mast with, for 30-degree angle, 87 pounds. If I change the angle, I'll change this 87 pounds, even though the 100 pounds may remain the same. Okay? So you see that just by changing the angle, I can change the amount of compressive load that I've put on the mast. By the same token, the horizontal load for 30 degrees would be 50 pounds across the mast. Okay? And again, if I change the angle, I will change this 50 pounds. You can see that if I change the angle out here to 60 degrees, that this 50 pounds is going to be greater and this 87 pounds is going to be less. Okay, So that's some principles of vectors, which I'd like to, you to keep in mind as we discuss some of the rigging adjustments. The mast is, a flex, is flexible and will move where the wires are pulling it. It's actually like a wet noodle, and it's going to go where you push it and pull it, uh, even though it seems pretty hard and rigid when you're standing at the deck level and leaning on it. It's still very long and very flexible, and it's going to move. So keep these principles in mind as we discuss some of the rigging adjustments that we're going to talk about. So let's look at the details of all of this. First, preparations. Remove the sails. Get them out of the way. Uh, you want to be able to look at the, the wires, the, the shrouds, the, um, the head stay, the mast itself uh, without the uh, interference of the sails. And if you're doing this in the spring before you put the sails on, uh, this is the time to do it. Uh, you want to slack all the turnbuckles. Uh, do not yet disconnect any turnbuckle, but you want to remove the tape and the cotter pins now, use proper fitting wrenches for turnbuckle flats so that you avoid rounding off those flats. And you want to make sure you do not unwind the wire. So when you, when you um, do this changing of the tension in the turnbuckle, it's very easy to unwind the wire if you don't properly use a wrench to hold it from unwiring. And I'll show you this in a second. Also, caution. When disconnecting a turnbuckle, ensure that the remaining wires will keep the mast standing, especially in the case of a deck step mast where you don't have this, the remainder of this mast down to the keel and having the support of the deck. 
it would be very easy in a deck step mast to lose the lose your mast if you improperly or inappropriately release a turnbuckle. Now there's two guiding lines uh, considerations when you're disconnecting a turnbuckle. Before you fully disconnect a turnbuckle, as you loosen it and you still have threads engaged in the turnbuckle, the wire should become completely slack before you release the turnbuckle. In other words, don't fully unthread a turnbuckle if there's still tension in the wire. Okay, if there's still tension in the wire, it means that that wire is still doing some job of supporting the mast. But it also means that you may have a dickens of a time getting it reconnected later on. Okay, so you want to make sure that you're able to unthread the turnbuckle to a point where it's fully slack before fully disengaging the turnbuckle. Okay, let's look at the turnbuckle at the deck level. And you have certain components here. You have, you have the bottom end, which has a toggle, and it can flex in either direction. And you have the turnbuckle body, which is this cage affair that has internal threads. You have this threaded stud, and you have this threaded stud, which is connected to the wire. And we'll look at that in a second. This upper thread is normally a right-handed thread. That is a normal direction thread. So when you want to tighten this turnbuckle, you will normally rotate it to the right as, as we're facing it right now. Okay, But you want to have a wrench on the flats of this stud so that when you turn this turnbuckle body, you don't unwind the wires, okay? which you can easily do. And even a half of a rotation can um, overstress some of those fine wires and lead to breakage of those fine wires. So it's very important that you use a properly fitting wrench on these flats. Of course, before you unwind it, you'll have to remove the cotter pins. You'll want to use a screwdriver. So these are some of the components that we'll be dealing with. And as I said before, don't release this turnbuckle unless you have complete slack in this wire before you release it. Now you're going to ask me why we're we releasing the turnbuckle. Well, in order to clean it and lubricate it at least once annually, you really ought to disconnect them. So cleaning the turnbuckles, uh, disconnect the turnbuckles one at a time. You don't disconnect uh, more than one turnbuckle on your boat. But what I'll normally do is disconnect one turnbuckle using the methods I already discussed, clean it, lubricate it, reassemble it, and then go to another one, to another turnbuckle, and do the same thing. So when you're doing this, you'll only have at most one turnbuckle at a time disconnected. You want to clean the stud and the body threads with a wire brush and a degreasing solvent and wipe them dry. Okay, get all the, the get all of the salt deposits, the uh, corrosion and so forth out of there. Inspect the barrels and the studs for cracks, and you can do this either by using a 5x magnifier or dye penetrant. And I'll show you this. And if you have any cracks at all, that component has to be replaced because if you have cracks. It means that you have uh, fatigue occurring, and once you have cracking occur, occur that will be a, a stress concentration that will lead to failure in some finite period of time. So if there are cracks, don't use it anymore. Lubricants, I recommend either Lanacote or Tef Gel or white lithium grease uh, for those threads. And you reconnect that turnbuckle and go on to another one. Now, when you have it apart, let's look at these components again. I've got some red arrows drawn in here. Where are the likely points that you could have cracks um, that are of concern? And basically, cracks are going to generally occur at a corner or a notch or a crevice or an area that can collect corrosion deposits. So when you look here, 
what this stud is welded to a cross T that is in under this shackle, and at this corner is a, is a, is a spot where if you bend this stud back and forth, you're going to have a concentration of stress in this, in this groove here, in this corner. So any place that you have a corner, inside corner generally, you're going to have a, a concentration of stress at that point. So you want to look closely at those points, whether your 5X magnifier or your die penetrant. Uh, this corner can be cracked. This threaded, it's internally threaded, uh, can be cracked. Here's where the wire connects to, this, to the uh, stud. The stud is swaged, uh, that is squeezed onto the wire, and especially your lower studs, the ones that you'll be working with to adjust, are a nice catch basin for water and salt, uh, corro other corrosion products. And this is where corrosion is going to build up. It's also an area of high stress, first off, because it was swaged, and some stress was imparted to that portion of the wire. And then secondly, any, any vibrations or resonance are going to be felt at this point. And this is a very uh, critical stress concentration location. Generally, the rest of the wire, the free-running part of the wire, is not going to be a problem as a rule. But this is the area where, where you want to pay very close attention to look very closely and see if you see any slight cracks in these wires or even one of these wires completely separated. If that's the case, that wire should be replaced. This is a swaged stud on the wire. This is a, um, a compression fitting, uh, such as a Norseman, where the wire is passed through this fitting. The wire is then spread out, splayed out. This cone is stuck inside the wire. The assembly is now pulled back into this fitting. This stud now is threaded into this fitting and it compresses the wire and, and this cone, and it holds it all nice and snug. These are good because you can more easily replace the wire without hiring a rigger. Okay, so these are locations to inspect for. Now, I usually recommend a 5X magnifier, and if you see anything with the magnifier that is suspicious, you might then go on and use die penetrant. Now, die penetrant is a very simple method of checking for cracks. It's better than plain visual. It's better than even a 5X magnifier. And basically, what die penetrant gets down to is there are three cans, three spray cans, okay? And one spray can is a solvent cleaner. You clean the area that you're going to check. Secondly, you apply a red dye, you spray it on and it's bright red, and then you wipe that dye off completely. And what will happen is the dye, if there is a crack, will seep into the crack because it's a special dye that has uh, very, the right consistency to, to ooze its way into a very fine crack. But you wipe off the excess and you can still at this point not see the crack. You then spray on from the third can a white developer, which is kind of like a powder, and what will happen is the dye in that crack will bleed into the white developer, and you will have a red line show up in the white developer that you've sprayed on, and that red line indicates a crack. This is an excellent method of checking parts for cracks. Uh, as I say, my recommendation is that you use a magnifier. If you're suspicious of anything, then go on to die penetrant. You can buy these three cans at McMaster. You can buy a whole kit of uh, many cans, but these, kit, these cans are roughly, for the three cans, maybe $50, maybe $15 a piece at McMaster.com. You can get them. You can also get, but I don't recommend this uh, unless you're a professional, uh, fluorescent dye penetrant kit, uh, kit. And these are rather expensive. They go about $600 for this kit, which I do not recommend um, 
for sailors like you and I, but this is another level of sophistication. Uh, so I recommend the magnifier and the three-part dye penetrant if needed. Okay. Okay, these numbers in the upper right-hand corner of my slides uh, indicate the steps in the process that we initially talked about. So this is the third step in that 12-step process. And this deals with centering the masthead side to side. Now, in order to do this, you have to have a method of measuring whether the masthead is, in fact, above the center of the boat from side to side. And you'll use a masthead halyard weighted with a pail of water. And this shows how that would work. Basically, you take your main halyard, you have a pail of water, and you suspend it over the side. You don't have it touching the water. And this is going to put a certain amount of stretch on that halyard. You then check the halyard against the tow rail or some other fixed structure on the boat and put a mark on the halyard. Then pick that bucket up, bring it over to the other side, and suspend it here, and check against the structure on that side. And if there's a difference in the two marks on that halyard, that means your masthead is not centered. And you're going to want to make adjustments in the upper shrouds in order to center that masthead. So this is the method of having a uh, consistent amount of stretch applied to that green halyard as it's coming down from the masthead because it will stretch. And if you pull on it just barehanded, you don't know if you're pulling with the same tension on both sides. Even though it's low stretch halyard, it's still going to stretch some. So use a main halyard weighted with a pail of water. Mark the halyard. Bring the water bucket to the other side. Now adjust the upper shroud turnbuckles hand tight to eliminate side to side differences in the halyard marks. Okay? So you're basically adjusting those uh, upper shroud turnbuckles and you're going back and forth, back and forth with the bucket of water to get the halyard marks the same on both sides of the boat. That gets your masthead initially centered. I might remind you that uh, this is easier if you have a dock hose available and instead of carrying a a full bucket of water from side to side in the boat, you might empty the bucket and then just refill it to a line that you've marked on the bucket using your dock hose. The first time I did this, I kept lugging the bucket across the deck, and that was silly. Okay, so that's, that's this method for centering the masthead. This next thing, and this is step four in the process, is mast rake. And rake, you recall, is the angle that the mast is angled back. In other words, the mast head, when viewed from the side, is not directly above the foot of the mast. And some boats might have no rake, might be completely straight. And some boats, the manufacturer might recommend a certain amount of rake. Okay. And I would, I would get the manufacturer's rake. And if, in a little bit, we'll talk about also observing performance of the boat under sail and how that interplays with the rake of the mast. But let's get this part first. So get the manufacturer's recommendation on rake of the mast. Now with a deck step mast, the rake is limited by the headstay and backstay length adjustment ranges. Pretty much period. Okay, you can adjust it pretty much anywhere where you want it within the guidance of the, of the manufacturer. A keel step mast is limited by the headstay and backstay length adjustments and the clearance at the deck wedges. So for a keel step, you recall that the mast penetrates the deck. And then there are wedges at the deck that support the mast at the deck level. Okay, so whatever clearance you have in that area will also uh, limit uh, the amount of ra rake that you can apply to the mast. You also have flexibility of the mast. 
Okay, let's talk about mast rake and weather helm. Weather helm is a tendency of the boat to round up to windward. And often uh, you're sailing along at uh, 10 or 12 knots, close hauled, and the boat fa feels fairly nicely balanced. And the wind now pipes up to 20 knots, and you have quite a bit of weather helm. Well, some weather helm is desirable because it gives you a feel for the boat. And if you and if you uh, lose lose your if the helmsman loses attention as to what they're doing in steering the boat, the boat is going to have a tendency to round up as, as opposed to veer off the wind. Okay. A lee helm is a tendency of the boat to fall off to leeward. Now, basically, mast rake increases weather helm. The more mass rake you have, the greater will be the weather helm of the boat. And the question that I would raise is, were you satisfied with the amount of weather helm the last time you sailed the boat? Was it too much? Well, maybe you need a little bit less rake in the mast. Uh, and let's look at this uh, mast rake and weather helm in a little bit more detail. I'm going to introduce two terms. One is center of effort and the other is center of lateral resistance. Wind pressure on the sails will act at the combined center of effort, and water pressure on the hull will act at the center of lateral resistance. So with that in mind, let's start looking at what these terms mean. Here's the boat. Here's the sloop. And we show the, um, the head sail and the main sail in red. And the wind is going to act on those sails. And what we can do is take the main sail and find the geometric center of the main sail. And that is roughly where all the forces of the wind acting on that sail can be thought to act on the sail for purposes of this discussion. You can find the geometric center basically by taking two sides of this sail and finding the midpoint. Draw a line from that midpoint up to the head. Draw a line from the midpoint of the leech to the tack. And where those two lines cross, that's going to be the approximate geometric center of that sail. And that's approximately where the wind forces will be act acting when you sum all the forces up. We can do a similar thing with the jib and find the jib center of effort. And then we can combine these two efforts, forces, into what's called the combined center of effort. That is, what is the point at which the, all the forces acting on the main sail and all the forces acting on the jib sail can be thought to act. Okay? And then we can take the underbody of the boat, shown in blue here, and uh, find a point which is again at the approximate geometric center of the underbody as, I'm, as shown here. And that geometric center will be the point at which side movement of the boat through the water, side movement, that the combined forces on the hull will act at that point. Okay? So we now have the center of effort of the sails, the wind on the sails, and the center of resistance of the water forces on the hull. And these two items determine weather helm or lee helm. Okay? And let's look at that in this view. Now I have the two sails in this boat and the wind is acting on those sails. And we did the calculation and at some point we found the center of effort, the combined center of effort, and the combined center of effort of the wind forces acting on these two sails was at this point and it's a force in this direction. It's not a force straight ahead. It's a force in this direction because part of that force is making the boat go ahead, 
And part of that force is heeling the boat and pushing it to the side, producing leeway in that boat. Okay? So this is the combined effort of both sails. And there's a vector component, a component of this force vector in the forward direction, which is making the boat go ahead determining boat speed ahead. And there's a side vector, which is acting across the boat, lateral, and it's healing the boat and, and pushing the boat sideways through the water. So the combined result is that the boat will not be moving straight ahead. It will actually be moving on some angle, which is a combination of its ahead speed and its lateral speed or leeway, okay? Boat leeway in this direction. Now, if the boat is moving to the side some, it's going to be trying to push water out of the way, and the water is going to resist that movement. So this is the resisting force of the water acting on the hull below the water. And that resisting force is acting at the center of lateral resistance. Okay. Now, if we have this situation where this side force on the sails, this side vector on the sails, is aft of the water force on, or the water resistance on the hull, you will have weather helm. That is, this, this boat wants to turn up into the wind under this condition because this lateral force is pushing it to port. This wind vector is pushing it to starboard. And since the, the lateral force of the water is ahead of the wind force, is going to want to turn up into the wind. This condition where the two line up will be a neutral helm. And this condition where the wind force is ahead of the water force will be a lee helm. Okay. Now changing the rake of the mast will change the location of this vector in relation to the center of lateral resistance of the hull and therefore change the helm of the boat. Okay? So you want to set the mast rake, first off, based on manufacturer spec. Now to do this, you can trim the boat fore and aft and use a plumb bob. In other words, is the boat level? Is it floating on its lines? Is the water line parallel to the water surface that the boat is floating in? Or are you heavy, heavily loaded at the stern? Or are, you, or are you heavily loaded at the bow? So check the water line of the boat first. Is the boat properly floating on its lines fore and aft? And then you can suspend a plumb bob from the masthead using the main halyard. And see where that plumb bob comes down to the deck or probably down to the boom. And if you have uh, stable water and not much wind, you might be able to get an approximation of the amount of mass rake that you have. Uh, you can also walk down the dock and try to eyeball it. And you might use a square a piece of cardboard and line up from a distance one side of that square with the deck and the other side of that square with the mast and make a very crude judgment as to how much rake you might have in your mast. Okay? Now, also, were you satisfied with the amount of weather helm last time you sailed the boat? Did you have too much weather helm? Well, if you did, you might be thinking about changing the rake of the mast. And 
within within limits, that's not hard to do. That's just tension adjustments in the fore and aft stays. If it's a great deal, then it becomes a um, uh, a more complex problem. But you can hand tighten the head stay and back stay turnbuckles to achieve the desired rake. If it's a great amount and the mass step needs adjustment, you may want to call a professional rigger. Now the mass step down sitting on top of the keel, and some of them have slots in them, and this can be moved fore and aft. But if you get to this point where you've got a lot of rake and you want to and you feel you need to adjust the step, in that case I would recommend having a professional rigger help you with that. Okay. Now just something to keep in mind, just to look at some numbers, let's say I have a mast that's 49 feet high above the deck and 7 feet down to the keel step from the deck. Okay. If I adjust a half inch here at the, at the keel step, I'm going to have 7 times that amount at the masthead. Right, seven into forty-nine is seven. So I'm going to have a half inch here. I'm going to have three and a half inches at the masthead. All right, but again, if you have to do this, get a professional rigger to help you. Now, here's what the deck wedges could look like. Uh, figure on the left, separate wood or rubber wedges, and these are actually uh, tapered, and they have a shoulder on them so they don't drop through but this shoulder hooks onto this metal ring here, and they might actually be driven in hard, okay, to actually help support the mast at that point. If you have this arrangement, these wedges, uh, once they're set, would be covered with a mat, with a boot, a mast boot, which is a rubber covering, which is then sealed around this, uh, this collar and sealed around the mast with, um, large hose clamps. You can also have a poor rubber wedge such as Spartite. And there's a whole process of doing that. You can Google Spartite and uh, get their information and their procedure and process and so forth. But these are the two basic types of wedges used on modern boats. So let's go to step five now. We've, got, we've gotten the masthead where we want it by side-to-side -side adjustments and fore-and-aft adjustments for the rake. And now we want to start working on the mid-height, on the spreader height of the mast. So to do this, initially you want to hand-tighten the lower shroud turnbuckles, and there could be four of these lower shrouds. To increase mast forward curvature at the spreaders, tighten the lower forward shrouds, and ease the lower aft shrouds. This would increase the, the bow of the mast forward so that the middle of the mast would be bowed forward and the head of the mast would, would be, appear to be curving back. To reduce the, fur, uh, the forward curvature, you do the opposite. You ease on the forward lowers and you tension the, the um, aft lowers. You do not want aft curvature generally in a mast. Okay, you only want forward curvature, and I'll show you a picture what I mean by forward curvature. You also, after you hand tighten these shrouds, want to check for side to side straightness and correct with the lower shrouds. Okay, you may have want to increase starboard tension and decrease port tension. But when you do this, you try to do it equally in the in the in the opposing uh, turnbuckle. So we're going to now tension to half spec. This is step six. Tension to half spec. Follow the manufacturer's rigging tension requirements. Low tension will generally lower sailing performance because when you get sail pressure on the mast, you're going to have deformation of the mast and change its shape and therefore change the shape of the sail. Ex excess tension can damage equipment. Use a tension gauge such as a lose. That's the manufacturer gauge. Now here's a chart. This is Island Packet 
and it shows a, a rigging tension guide. And you'll notice that it's for a certain ambient temperature that says 50 to 80 degrees. And each of the boat models, and here's for an Island Packet 45, and these are the different rigging wires that we're talking about. The, the uppers, that means the upper shrouds, the intermediate shrouds. Now, the, these boats that I'm, that I'm referring to here ha had a double spreader and, and additional shrouds. Aft lowers, forward lowers, check stays, they went with the intermediates and the back stays. Okay? The point is, there are numbers given. And these are numbers given using a lose gauge, L-O-O-S, PT2 or PT3, depending on the size of the boat. Okay? And here's a lose gauge, a lose tension gauge. What it has is a, a, a very stiff spring here and a lanyard. You can pull on this piece of plastic, which slides in this groove, and it pulls this pointer back to different numbers. And the halyard, I've drawn it in red, passes through these stops and is hooked into this part of this plastic fitting here. And it's actually going to deform the wire. Now, I've exaggerated the amount of deforming. It's not going to do quite as much as shown in, in my diagram. This will measure tension based on how far you had to pull it to hook this plastic hook onto this wire. In other words, you start out with this hooked on to the shroud, and it's out here, and then you pull on this piece against the, um, the spring and hook it on this part of the, um, the shroud, and that's going to then come to rest at some number here. And in this case, you can see it's at about seven. Okay, so that's a lose um, index of seven. Okay, and then there's a scale on here that tells you for different numbers what are the uh, the uh, forces in that wire. Okay, but this is a lose tension gauge referred to by this manufacturer uh, for this boat for each of the wires in that boat. So after you've done that, you've gone to half spec. In this case, if this said the upper should be at 40 on the lose gauge, I would initially tune this at 20. We want the half, half spec, and we now want to verify the mass shape. This is step seven. This is where art and judgment come into the process. It's iterative, and you won't get it right the first time. An adjustment for one purpose will change something else. All right? The mass is somewhat like a half-cooked noodle and will react to how you push it and pull it. So mass shape key, once the mast head is in position, that is side to side and fore and aft, okay? the key to mass shape is the horizontal position of the spreader base the horizontal position of the spreader base. Okay, you're moving the middle of the mast to where you want it to get the shape of the mast that you want. Now remember the vector discussion that we had earlier. And let's look at the this again, the vector principles. I pull in this direction of the red line, and it's going to pull this mast both horizontally and press it down vertically. Okay. So here's a cross section of the mast. I've cut the mast at the spreader base, and I'm looking down from the top of that cut mast. And I have forces acting on the spreader base in these directions. I have compression from the spreaders themselves that are being pulled in towards the mast by the shroud tension on the spreader tips. I also have tension in these lower shrouds pulling in these directions. So you can see that if I tension this lower starboard forward here, it's going to pull the mast in that direction. Well, you're going to want to resist that 
by a compensating adjustment here, okay, or accommodate it. So just keep this, this figure in mind that you're making these adjustments in different directions. And thus you're going to move the spreader base horizontally in different directions. So this is still number seven, shaping the mass. Now, once you've done that, you've, you've gone to half spec, you've gone to half spec on your um, lower shrouds, uh, sight up the side of your mass and estimate the amount of forward curve at the spreader base. Now you can use a main halyard connected to the gooseneck and hold tight to form a straight reference line. Let's look at this for a second. Here's um, the mass curve. Now it's kind of exaggerated in this figure, but this is what I'm talking about by forward curve at the, at the spreader base level. If you, if you were standing here at the, um, at the boom and you sight up the mast, you put your cheek against the mast and you sight up the mast, this midpoint is going to appear to be curved forward compared to the mast head. Okay? Now it's exaggerated in this figure. You can use your main halyard as a sight reference. If you take the main halyard and tack it down here to the gooseneck and stretch it tight, uh, not so tight as to deform the mast, but just stretch it taut, you can sight up and you can now get a judgment as to how much curve you have in that, in that mast. Okay? So do that and compare with what you amount of uh, curve you want in the mast. Adjust the lower shroud turnbuckles to, to obtain your desired curve. Now count the turns made on each turnbuckle. If you increase tension on one side of the boat, reduce tension on, on the other side by a similar amount. Keep notes on each change as you progress. Okay? and sight up the mast and, and again check the results. You may have to do this several times and it may not be precisely the same adjustments on both sides. Remember hysteresis. Okay? So this is checking for four and a half mast curve. Now still shaping the mast, sight up the front of your mast and estimate the side to side curve. And in this stretch your jib halyard down to the deck as a sight reference. So here's the mast sighted from the front of the mast, the forward side of the mast, and take your jib halyard, stretch it down to the deck, pull it taut, again not real tight, but taut enough to be straight, and sight up and see what you have, and it's going to give you an indication as to whether you have and how much side-to-side -side mass curve you have. You want zero side-to-side -side curve in the mast because with side-to-side -side curve you're going to have a difference in performance on the two sides of your boat. Same as with the mast head being off-center is going to change the performance on both sides of your boat. Okay. So recheck centering a masthead after you've done this with the water bucket. Okay. Now this is step seven. We've gone to half spec on the uh, tensions. And the process from here on out is very similar at three-quarter spec and full spec on the tensions. But let's go through the steps just very approximately. Tension to three, here's step eight three-quarter spec on the tensions, using the lose gauge, three-quarter spec, again, verify mass shape by the same methods that we used already, all right? Go to full spec, do the same thing, verify mass shape, all right? And um, you may now have to do some tweaking you may find out that um, one side of the mass, the, the lower shrouds, are not exactly the same. You added some turn, turns here, you deducted some there, 
and you might find that the tensions are not precisely the same. This is now the judgment and the art part of this, where you're going to have to say, all right, I'm trying to balance off between the mass curve that I have, the mass straightness that I have from the forward side, versus what the lose gauge tells me as far as tension on each of those shrouds goes versus what the number of turns were that I put on and took off various turnbuckles. So you have several variables that are interactive with one another, but not that it won't come out precisely accurate. Okay? And this is where judgment comes into the process. So you're going to go through this and get the best balance that you can get on what you want to end up with on, on mass shape and rigging tension. The next point, step number 12 in the process, is to do sea trials because this is where the proof is in the pudding. In this, you want to check the pointing ability and boat speed when you're close hauled on both tacks. If it's different, if you can't point the same or you see a significant difference in boat speed on each tack, well, it could be that the masthead is not centered or the masthead is falling off to leeward because of in inadequate upper shroud tension. Okay? So check these things under sail. Set up the side of your mast under sail to validate mass curve. And how does the main sail shape look? Because remember, mass curve will interact with the cut of the sail. Am I happy with the shape of the mainsail as I'm sailing close hauled? Sight up the front of the mast under sail and determine if the mast head is falling off to leeward. Is the mast bowing in the middle to the leeward side? That is, does the mast appear does the mast head appear to be pointing to windward because the middle of the mast is bowing to leeward? Okay? So be cognizant of these things and you'll want to make some corrections to them. Still on sea trials, check that the lure shrouds are not excessively loose. Often you'll be on a boat and you're sailing close hauled and brisk winds and you'll find uh, a lure shroud that's uh, clanking back and forth because there's no tension at all on it. I'd say that, that uh, the tensions are probably not right in, in that condition. Uh, Site up the head stay and determine if it's sagging excessively. Now remember the head stay is a long stretch from the from the tack at the at the bow to the masthead. Uh, on a 30 foot boat it could be 35, 40 feet. And uh, you got the pressure of the jib on that head stay. It's going to have a certain amount of concavity that is bowing inward in that head stay. But is, is it excessive? Do you feel that it's changing the shape of the jib? Any excessive sign of jib leach flutter, which can result from a bagged out sail. How is weather helm? We talked about the components of weather helm and the factors that go into it. How is the weather helm? Are you happy with it? So though, that's the basic process going up to step 12 in my process. And um, once you've gotten the basic uh, adjustments made, the rest of it is um, some uh, art and trial and error. Now, I want to just mention briefly a stay sail sloop or cutter. I've talked about a simple sloop up to this point. And let me just briefly mention a stay sail where we have an inner forestay and we also have check stays that balance off that inner forestay. And in this case I have a single spreader stay sail schooner with no spreader at this point. Okay. And you can see in this case you're going to have to do some additional tuning of the inner force day and the check stay when you're doing the the mast bowing forward bowing adjustment you've been adjusting the at the spreader level you also have this inner force day and the check stay that are going to affect the bowing of the mast 
but also getting proper tension in, in this inner force day to properly uh, interact with your stay sail. So this add, this, simply adding this inner force day adds additional complexity to the process. And then you can have a stay sail schooner with, with a bigger boat, taller mast, might have a second spreader, a double spreader rig, and you'll have with that intermediate shrouds. So here you have one shroud comes up to the lower spreader and into the base of the second spreader. Another shroud comes up past both shredders and up to the mast head. Well, this intermediate shroud is going to also affect the lower shroud base location as well as the upper shroud base location. Okay, and the inner four stay and check stay. So you see the addition of these components multiplies the complexity of the process above what a simple sloop uh, process would be. Okay, so that's basically the process. Now there's additional rig configurations above the uh, stay sail schooners that I've talked about, stay sail sloops that I've talked about. Others might be fractional rigs where the uh, jib, where the head stay comes up not all the way to the masthead but part way up. There are cat rigs, lanteen rigs, multiple spreader rigs, catches, yawl, schooners. Each presents its own special considerations. And most are much more complex than the simple rigs I've shown up to this point. But if you start and understand the basics with a simple sloop, then it's easier to grow into these more complex shapes. So, know your boat. The more you know about your boat, the better sailor you'll be. Uh, know also what maintenance you have the skills and knowledge to perform. I'm not urging that you go out beyond your capabilities, but, but at least some of these concepts will hopefully enable you to look at your rig and make some judgments about it. Do I have to do some maintenance or adjustment? Do I have to hire a professional rigger? I find that many experienced sailors do not know if their rigs are properly tuned. They look at them. They hope they stay up. They hope they don't break. And um, hopefully, in most cases, they're right. So um, hopefully, this seminar will encourage you to research and study this important aspect of boat maintenance and operation.